Recently, I watched a video about Atlantic Canada, the provinces of Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island. It was fascinating. It's a region I relate to, being from the other side of the Atlantic in Scotland. Seeing some of the landscapes that really remind me of Scotland. It's just a beautiful place, but one thing that I do know about it is it's relatively less populated compared to the other big cities and other provinces in Canada. So I seen this video, I wanted to watch it and learn more. It's called No Major Cities, Why So Few Canadians Live on the East Coast. So again, you can tell me in your opinion why you think so few Canadians live on the East Coast. Uh, but yeah, I guess this video will answer those questions, so, or that question. So let's watch this and we can find out. New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., and Miami are home to tens of millions of Americans and, That's and all exist on the Atlantic coast of the United States. Actually, yeah, I never really just considered that when I was thinking about it. When you compare the, the east side or the Atlantic Ocean side of the USA, which is so heavily populated, these, these cities and compare it to Canada. It's actually interesting that there's such a huge disparity, huge difference. Let's find out why, I guess. But if we look just to the north, Canada's largest metro regions are mostly inland, well away from the ocean. So why doesn't Canada have a major city on their east coast? Yeah, I guess it's these, I guess those still got the access to the river that goes Hello by and welcome to Geography by Toronto, Jeff. Montreal. As North America was settled by Europeans, most of the original colonies were on the East Coast, which makes sense given its physical proximity to Europe. But while this led to many of America's largest cities being on its East Coast, the same story has not played out for Canada. And there's a geographic reason for this. But first, if you're a fan of me, consider supporting me on Substack. Paid subscribers get even more geography every week, special callouts, ad-free podcast episodes, and these special perks. So if you want to engage with me even more, Substack is the place, and I will see you there. Before we get to why Canada doesn't have a major East Coast population center, we should first explore just a little bit how Canada was colonized, grew, and expanded through the decades. Long before Europeans set foot on North America, of course, Canada was home to a wide array of indigenous peoples with rich cultures, traditions, and trade networks. But because this is about the Canada of today, let's go ahead and jump to when Europeans first landed on the continent. In terms of European exploration, modern day Canada is believed to be the first region Europeans would explore. Around the year 1000, an expedition by Norwegian explorer Leif yeah, Erikson would establish a short-lived settlement named Vinland, thought to be located in present-day Newfoundland. However, it was not until the late 1400s that a more sustained exploration and settlement would begin. In 1497, under the patronage of England's King Henry VII, explorer John Cabot would set sail for the Americas where he's believed to have made landfall on the island of Newfoundland. His expeditions demonstrated the abundance of fish, setting the stage for lucrative fishing grounds that would attract future European explorers and settlers. But while England would kick off the current exploration of modern-day Canada, it would be France who would actually settle the region first. France entered the scene in the 1500s when Jacques Cartier was tasked by King Francis I to find a direct maritime route to Asia. Between 1534 and 1542, Cartier made three voyages, and he would eventually explore the Gulf of St. Lawrence and claim the land for France, naming the territory Canada, derived from the Iroquoian word Canada, meaning village. The French would be the first to establish a permanent European settlement with the founding of Quebec City by Samuel de Champlain in 1608. Champlain's establishment became the foothold for France in the Americas, and he is often called the father of New France. The early French settlers forged alliances with multiple indigenous tribes, primarily to establish fur trade networks. Due to competing interests in North America, the 1600s and 1700s saw frequent wars between England and France. In 1610, the British established their first permanent settlement called Cooper's Cove, today known as the town of Cupids on the island of Newfoundland. The British and French colonies coexisted, but with increasing animosity and frequent skirmishes. A culmination of global British-French tensions would lead to the Seven Years' War between 1756 and 1763, more locally known as the French and Indian Wars in the colonies, which ended in British victory. The 1763 Treaty of Paris led to Britain gaining control of almost all French territories in North America, marking the end of New France. Then the British North America Act in 1867 marked the beginning of Canada as a federated nation, initially with four provinces, Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia. The westward expansion of the Canadian Pacific Railway 
brought promise and opportunity, leading to the inclusion of other provinces and territories into the Confederation. Canada's settlement began on its east coast much in the same way the United States did. But where many of America's first cities became some of its largest population centers, Canada's did not. But before we get to why Canada's largest cities are not on its east coast, if you're enjoying this video, hit that subscribe button. More fun geography videos are just a single click away. When most people think of Canada, they're probably thinking about a few key areas. More often than not, they'll think about Montreal and Toronto, which are within Quebec and Ontario respectively. They'll probably also think of British Columbia, the home to Vancouver on the west coast of Canada. And they may even think about Alberta, home to Calgary, Edmonton, and Canada's vast oil industry. But what they probably don't think about as often is Canada's smaller Atlantic coast provinces of Newfoundland and Labrador, Prince Edward Island, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia. Which is crazy because these provinces are quite spectacular. Mm. The geography of the Atlantic provinces is shaped by the Atlantic Ocean and defined by a diverse blend of ecosystems from the highlands to the lowlands, forests to tundra, and bountiful coastlines. Yeah, that's the thing that's really attracted me to that region as well, as well as having that connection with the Atlantic Ocean in the UK, but seeing the landscapes, they are so breathtaking, I guess in a way it's kind of good that these places are not as populated or have, as it says, maybe no major cities, although we have places like Halifax, but uh, it's good that there's no major cities. Maybe this would become more spoiled, I don't know, or maybe it would lose, I guess it wouldn't lose its beauty, but uh, I guess in a way it's kind of good that not as many people live over there. The area is dotted with thousands of lakes, carved by rivers, and features several major bays and inlets, notably the Bay of Fundy, known for having the highest tides in the world. Mm. The easternmost areas such as Newfoundland present a rugged terrain with fjords, mountains, and barren cliffs that plunge into the sea, whereas the mainland part of Labrador is a mix of boreal forests and arctic tundra. As we move south, the terrain shifts to the rolling landscapes and fertile valleys of Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island, the latter marked by its vibrant red soil and sand. New Brunswick's geography is equally diverse, boasting dense forests, fertile river valleys, and the far northern tip of the Appalachian mountain range. So and the coastal location of these provinces influences their climates, leading to relatively moderate temperatures, but also high precipitation, including heavy snowfall in the winter. In many ways, Canada's Atlantic provinces share many of the same geographic features of the United States' New England. But unlike New England, Canada's Atlantic provinces don't have a major city to call their own in the same way that New England has Boston. Mm. Canada does have cities on its east coast, but none of them are nearly as large as Canada's other major cities such as Toronto, Montreal, or Vancouver. And this is odd because, given the continued power and influence of ports on establishing major population centers, the assumption would be that Canada would need a major city on its east coast in order to facilitate trade. And while Canada does have Halifax, Nova Scotia, a medium-sized city with a fairly large port, it doesn't break into the top 10 of Canada's largest cities. Mm -hmm. And much of this has to do with a single, massive river. The St. Lawrence River has really been foundational for Canada. Its size and width has allowed for not only an abundance of fresh water, but also the ability for large freight ships to travel in and out with relative ease. Mm, so Canada just had been able to bypass these places uh, and give you yeah, a bit more like yeah being able to like set up cities and things here as well so i guess like you'd really think about it like places like toronto uh, montreal quebec and things are all relatively close compared to like newfoundland and places like that as well and perhaps most important is that the river connects directly to the great lakes allowing for transportation directly in and out without the need for a land crossing in many ways the saint lawrence river is to canada as the Mississippi River is to the United States. So it's not surprising that Canada's oldest city, Quebec City, exists at the mouth of the St. Lawrence. As the French were looking for a route to Asia, the St. Lawrence's sheer size would inevitably lead them to believe that it could go quite a ways inland and maybe even to the Pacific Ocean. Now, given its size, the St. Lawrence River made transportation relatively easy in a country that is otherwise pretty rugged and cold. This really enabled many of Canada's largest cities to grow in ways they otherwise would not have. 
Canada's largest city, Toronto, exists in what would be called Canada's Golden Horseshoe, named in part because it has an abundance of fertile agricultural lands, combined with an incredible amount of fresh water. But while agriculture was and still is very valuable, shipping it could be quite expensive. And it's for this reason that we see major cities appear along the St. Lawrence River, or even on a tributary river such as Ottawa, rather than the East Coast. It's far cheaper to transport things by water than by land. And the fact that goods can be made, produced, grown, or manufactured in Toronto or Montreal, and then shipped down river and out to the world, was far more enticing than transporting them by land to Halifax first. This mm. helps explain why the Port of Montreal ships approximately 40 million tons of cargo every year, compared to Halifax's less than 20 million tons, despite Montreal being hundreds of miles inland. That river is really so bad. As I've already to mentioned Canada. in this video, Canada's Atlantic provinces do have a lot of Canadians living within them, and they do have plenty of cities dotting the east coast of the country. While these four provinces might not have as many people as Toronto, they still combine to create an incredibly important region for Canada as a whole. Canada's Atlantic provinces are led by Nova Scotia with about 1 million people in total. This would be followed by New Brunswick with 775,000 people, Newfoundland and Labrador with 510,000 people, and finally Prince Edward Island with 154,000 people. Notably, however, while Prince Edward Island has the fewest people of any full province in Canada, it's also the province with the highest population density due to its area size. Oh, Canada's other okay. provinces all just happen to be really large, hmm. and this region would be led by the city of Halifax, Nova Scotia, with about 465,000 people within its metro region. This would be about one-tenth the size of Montreal, Quebec, which has about 4.2 million people. Following Halifax would be St. John's in Newfoundland and Labrador with 212,000 people. St. John's also has the distinction of being the easternmost city in North America. Moncton, St. John, and Fredericton in New Brunswick would be the third, fourth, and fifth largest cities in the region, with 157,000, 130,000, and 108,000 people respectively. Prince Edward Island's largest city would be Charlottetown with about 79,000 people. All four provinces combined have a population of only 2.4 million people, which is a little less than the Vancouver, British Columbia metro region. Canada's Atlantic region features some incredible landscapes, but the fact that the St. Lawrence River was able to connect the Great Lakes to the Atlantic Ocean probably stunted its growth. Mm. And because of this, these four provinces will probably always be smaller than their inland neighbors. I hope you enjoyed learning more about Canada's mm. Atlantic provinces. Yeah, that was really cool. I, I did actually consider that river, but uh, to have it explained like that, it really makes so much sense. So that's really cool. Again, I guess maybe people on the East Coast are kind of thankful for that river. The, the places they live are not so populated at the moment. Like when you see places like Halifax and uh, these other places, these other cities and just the provinces in general. I feel like one of the big things that's nice is the lack of population. I was going to say the lack of density, but when you see Prince Edward Island being so, being the densest province is kind of interesting as well. But uh, yeah, these are just be beautiful places, beautiful provinces, and I'm kind of glad they are just the way they are, but it's kind of it's interesting just to find out the answer to that question, why so few Canadians live there, but if you do live there, tell me what you like about living there. Thanks.